So, hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Vivian Parry. I'm a science broadcaster and journalist and I absolutely love working with the NMS. And I love working with the NMS because they are this fantastic amalgam of hot science and creativity. And here we are today for picture, uh, the Picture of Health uh, exhibition. And we're also in their beautiful new building. So just marvel and look around, it's just uh, wonderful. But A Picture of Health is the third of really what I think are the astonishing set of arts uh, and science interactions. So, and at their heart is always the wonderful, magnificent woman that is Professor, the wonderful, where is she? Mandy. Yeah. She's gone away. Without Mandy, about the wonderful Mandy Fisher, um, these things would not have happened. It was really her creative spark uh, that started uh, both, first of all, noble textiles, um, then suffrage uh, science, and now a picture of health. And we're delighted to welcome all of you to this building. And can I say to all of those who are watching uh, on streaming, hello. I'm sorry you couldn't be here. You're missing out on a lot, but luckily you're able to hear all of our wonderful speakers. So we're going to play this in two parts today. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion at the beginning, art and science uh, interface. Then we're going to have a brief interlude during which you'll have time to look at the picture of health exhibits outside and to talk to each other and perhaps talk about some of the work and try making a kite. Well, I'll tell you about this a bit uh, later. And then in our second session, we end to talk about communicating science and the role of art and science in that. So let's, without any more ado, there's Mandy Fisher. Mandy Fisher, would you please take a bow? <laughs> Andy Fisher, the, the creative spark behind all of these wonderful interactions with her fantastic uh, team there as well, and we'll come to them uh, for a, a bit later. So let me introduce you to our first uh, panel. Um, on my left, uh, Professor Peter Openshaw. He's a viral immunologist. He specializes in the virology of infection in the lung. And he will be very familiar to you all as the voice of sanity during COVID on every news uh, briefing. Um, then we have Angela Palmer, one of our most distinguished uh, sculptors, and we'll talk about her magnificent work in a little while. Uh, then we have uh, Giles Yeo, Giles of the MRC Metabolic Disease Unit in Cambridge. His special interest is in genes and feeding and uh, behaviours and the way that there are so many different circuitry in our brains that affect how we eat, what we eat and what it does to us. And last but absolutely not least, Michael Rosen. Uh, Michael Rosen, uh, poet, uh, he will be very familiar to you all from his books, his poetry, his radio, and actually the whole nation held its breath when he was desperately ill with COVID. But he's been returned to us, for which actually the entire country was willing him on to be better. So we're going to talk about, uh, I'm actually going to start uh, with Angela, if I may, Peter. And Angela, you did a sculpture of the COVID virus, or as Peter would say properly, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, <laughs> why? Why? Well, it was during um, lockdown, I think like so many people, um, you started to wonder what is the point of the work you're doing if you're not a frontline worker. I think a lot of people went through slight anguish 
you know, what, what's the real meaning of your work? And, uh, and I see, I, I, most of my work is really just peeling back the layers to show what, what's hidden beneath the surface. Um, and I'd seen the, the, the virus particle shown on television, like so many of us, in that sort of red plastic sphere that looked a bit like a Christmas decoration. Um, not at all scientific. And, um, and I just thought one day, maybe, maybe I could um, recreate the virus particle. Um, not easy, because as I discovered, it is more than a thousand times smaller than the width of human hair. So um, up till then, I've been doing um, anatomical work. I've done the brain and actually the full body and, 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 um, and various other parts of the body. But to do something of that scale was slightly off the charts. So um, I, I sought a lot of help through scientists until I finally managed to, um, to get the cross-sections from um, a professor in Massachusetts who was famously modeling the SARS virus. So let's have a look. We think we've got a film now that we can see both the artwork, which is now actually in the Science Museum. Yeah, and in, in, you can see it in the Science Museum. And it's going to be there for a year in the Injecting Hope exhibition before it goes to Edinburgh and then Manchester. Yeah. And I think we've also got a video. Just uh, here we are. Yes. So the big question, how could I possibly represent this virus particle in the same technique. I got in touch with Professor Elspeth Garman, who's a molecular biologist in Oxford, who then said, look, you need to get in touch with Professor Dimitri Corkin, who's a bioinformatics professor. He's at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts, and he famously models viruses. So he sent me the cross sections of the, the protein spike and then I had to wait a few months, and then finally he'd finished this gargantuan task of the, the actual, the entire sphere, which I think several laboratories were involved in. And we ended up with 28 cross sections, but on a mammoth scale, because it was just, the, the, part, the, the particle proteins were just denoted with tiny, tiny little dots, but thousands of them on each sheet. So that's when I set, set down in my studio ordered huge sheets of glass and started engraving. It's very intense work because if I make the slightest mistake, I have to jettison that glass and it's hugely expensive. So there's a little bit of pressure. Glass, um, it allows you to create a drawing in space. And with glass, you're actually, when you engrave onto glass, you're actually taking something away. But in doing so, you're creating the illusion of something that is floating before you. And there it is, isn't it extraordinary? And I think the wonderful thing is, is when we talk us through this, Andrew, because the wonderful thing is it appears and then it disappears. Yes, rather like the virus. <laughs> um, because from the front you see it, and as you pass around, um, it, 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 it actually, yeah, like the virus, it disappears, but then reappears. So it kind of, it kind of torments us in the same way. Um, but the other thing is that you see it. I, I think for, for a lot of people, um, it was strangely beautiful. And we'd have been imagining this horrific menace, this, this vile um, disease particle and, and seeing it, it was, it was strangely beautiful. And I think, you know, like nature, it is, it, is, it is like, it is nature. And so much of nature is of course beautiful. And for people seeing it trapped, I think that that was that kind of, gave a lot of people agency because of course, it, it, you see it there in a glass chamber trapped just as it had trapped us. Um, mankind had been trapped by it and seeing it there sort of vulnerable, exposed. Um, I, I, I think it was, it, I think that people felt it, it's, scientists have got a handle on this and it gave them a lot of hope seeing it like that. And Peter, what do you think as a virologist when you see this wonderful artwork? I think images are so important to us as scientists. They can really transform and focus the way in which we think about science. I remember the first time I saw the structure of the <laughs> T-cell receptor with the MHC, matrix compatibility, presenting a peptide. That image completely captivated the audience. You could hear a pin drop when we first saw this interaction, which we tried to internally visualize, but we'd never actually seen. And this sort of image is 
so crucial, I think, to accelerating science and be enabling us to really think about what it was. But means. actually, seeing an image like that allows you to see really uh, extra things about the virus that perhaps you might not have appreciated before and its vulnerabilities. Yes, yes. And I, I think, you know, it's easy to appreciate on the sort of macro scale how the lung expands and contracts as a mechanical device. You, once you've seen it in, a, in, in an operating theater or you've seen the heart pumping, you can really visualize what it is there. But I think it's only with this sort of very extraordinary imaging that we can see um, the same sort of concept emerging with on the micro scale. So you wouldn't have been able to produce this work without the science. I mean, not just, you know. I could produce a, any of my work. Science, but, 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 but yeah, actually the, the intricate uh, yeah. detail of this yeah. comes from cutting edge science. It's all collaboration. Yeah, all my work yeah. is, is collaborative with scientists. I'm incredibly lucky that scientists are willing to work with me. Um, and I always give them a piece of my work if they if they do collaborate with me. So that's a cause. There's quite a lot of people getting quite excited <laughs> about that. He's got he, he's he's got the spike because the first thing he did was model the spike because of course that that was the piece of the armory that um, that, that scientists were able to work with um, because well our our, our, our med medics will tell us that that's the part that invades the human cells. So they need so why Dmitry Corkin was was modeling. The, the spike first was he was he was trying to see the structure um, to, to model the structure so scientists could understand it and um, he said that he'd done the previous SARS virus and he said that the the COVID nineteen um, virus spike was thirty percent more effective in puncturing the human cells than the previous one um, so, so so I did the spike first and and then I did the the, the sphere and um, it was unveiled in Oxford at the, um, at the uh, Museum of, um, of Science and they said, that, that, sorry, the Natural History Museum and um, Sarah Gilbert came to unveil it. And I went to meet so her. So Sarah Gilbert who Sarah, Sarah Gilbert was the, who, on the AstraZeneca who, vaccine. pioneer of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And um, I went to meet her, take her in. The, 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 they gave me a special room. It was like a sort of shrine, very dark room for this great sphere. And she said, that she was really daunted to, to be confronted by it. She said, this is what I have been battling for <laughs> months and months and months, and now I'm being taken into this room. Um, and, and she also said that she found it yeah, strangely beautiful. But, but what's fascinating is you were telling me before that you have all the details, but you don't know what necessarily is going to come out of it, or indeed whether it will even work as an artwork. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my work is very similar to, to scientists in that there's a lot of failure along the way, but from failure, you know, leads to the odd success. And it's all about, you know, relentless research, um, interrogation and, and, that, and that hope and hope and hope that it will turn out in the end and, and that nature will reveal itself. And um, that is what so many scientists, I mean, we're very, uh, you know, we were, us the scientists work in very similar ways, I think. Well, I think you will all agree that she succeeded rather spectacularly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Giles, Hello. tell us first a, a bit more about what you actually do in Cambridge. So I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geneticist by, by trade, and I happen to study body weight. And one end of the spectrum sits obesity. So I'm an obesity geneticist, in, in that's what I study. But what we now know by its very definition, by studying the genetics of body weight and obesity, we are by definition studying the genetics of how our brain controls food intake. So I'm a accidental neuroscientist. I sort of accidentally backed myself up into the brain. Oh my God, what, 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 is, what, what is this place? And so from there, over the past what, 20 years now, we've been trying to, we up in Cambridge and, and, and uh, other labs in the world have been trying to understand the circuits within the brain that control our feeding behavior, why we're hungry, why we feel full, how come I feel pukey, you know, oh my God, I love uh, uh, foods adorned with yellow M's, you, that, 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 that kind of thing. And so we're interested in the circuitry um, underlying our feeding behavior, how we respond to food and the food environment around us. So when the picture of health team came mm. along and said, what is your picture of health, Giles? You took a really rather novel uh, 
sense of the, the novel take on this. And let's see what you actually did, and perhaps you talk us through it. So it, it, incidentally, I'm going to have to say, so this is the circuitry, neurocircuitry of feeding represented in textile form. Can I please say that I was the scientific director? Um, the, the, the artist, my wife, Dr. Jane Goodall, and her sister, uh, uh, Claire, Claire Goodall. <laughs> They're the artists. I just want to what, what, what my, right. describe. Um, and so what um, we did, or at least what Jane and Claire did, was this was um, inspired by a Palestinian uh, textile artist, Samar uh, Hajazi, based in Toronto. And what she uses is she uses these things called solbi which is almost like a piece of material um, that you can sew into and embroider into, but it's made of starch, okay? And so- a, I think you've got a video. Oh. Can you run a video? Because it will just show her making this. Okay, so here is, oh, so here's the, uh, uh, we're laying out the patterns, this is the circuits, which I'm saying, well, put a bit here and that bit there. Claire is doing the sewing and you're sewing the circuits into this soldi, which is this starch-based cloth. Now, what happens, however, is when you, therefore, because it's starch based and you dip it into water, the starch dissolves. And so what you're left with is the circuits in, in thread. But as it dissolves, it also permeates the uh, thread with starch. And so when, you, when it actually dries, so here, here's the- So they go all stiff. The, the, exactly, they go all stiff. But what we did, obviously, I didn't try and put it over my head. You could fit it over my head, of course, but we put it over a salad bowl and then let it drip dry and let it set. And then you end up with, in effect, it's not like a head necessarily, but our representation of the feeding circuitry, but in textile form. And the, the scientific element of it comes from, because there is an approach in science we call clarity, where you can take sections of brains or whole mice brains, for example, and make them transparent. Okay, and, and you can then, so if you have now labeled a specific feeding circuitry brain with green fluorescent protein, and you've made the brain entirely transparent, you can then use something called light sheet microscopy and look at it and sort of take slices like you've done here and actually take slices all the way through. So you end up with a 3D image of a brain with the circuits of your choice. And so what we've done here using textiles and Solby is to try and uh, uh, replicate the scientific technique of clarity and replicate some of the work that we've been doing with regards to the neurocircuitry of feeding. Fantastic. So this is a picture of health, as far as you're concerned, because um, it's really, what you do is you look at some of the things where you have genetic variants that make things go wrong, and it's from what goes wrong that you can work out what should go right and help those who have problems. Absolutely, because how best to understand how something works than when something doesn't work, and particularly if you have a severe genetic disruption, a deletion, something, a big mutation that happens, and you break a circuit, for, for, for lack of a better term. And so this is a picture of health. But then from the picture of health, you can find out, well, if you actually have this part of the circuit that goes wrong, someone ends up with severe obesity, someone loves eating fatty food a lot more than someone else, et cetera, et cetera. Then you begin to unpick the circuits. Oh, wait a minute. This is the fat sensing circuit. Oh, wait a minute. This is the circuit that tells you when you're full or, or you know, when I feel pukey or oh, ooh, the, the, the reward parts of the brain. And so when you see mutations that actually target specific circuits, you're then able to then take the picture of health and to take a picture of disease, I guess, but they interact with, the, with, with, with each other. And obviously different um, populations, ethnicities, backgrounds will have different changes in their genes that make them different, that make them like different types of foods, that make them different body shapes and body sizes. And so, it's interesting to use genetics to actually look at the average picture of health and well, what happens when you begin to sprinkle changes in this picture of health? What, uh, you know, what happens? Sometimes things get better, rarely. Most most times things get worse, and through that, you're then able to understand how the circuitry works. Phenomenal. And was there anything that doing this whole process made you think differently about your science? I think, <laughs> given that it took. Um, a whole weekend and a lot of wine and a lot of sewing, <laughs> none of which I was involved with, um, in, in, in order to just represent. So I had to sort of explain, a, explain the science, which is, which, which is fine. But all we have represented here are, in effect, three main circuits, just three circuits. 
and just is just obviously some, some representation of it. But there are obviously billions, trillions of, of neurons interacting with each other. And so just three circuits create something quite this complex. What does it do when you're actually looking at all of the circuits within your brain and how they're actually wired together? I knew this, obviously, I study it, but in order to see it so, um, A, the size that it is, uh, um, and actually staring you in the face, I found that rem remarkable, but I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. We we love this <laughs> and, and, and incidentally, not that I'm trying to sell a piece of work, but but which I'm not. <laughs> the, the piece of work is not up here. It's actually when you guys leave this evening and as you're exiting the building, it's it's hanging on the right hand side of the main entrance to the to, to the door. So you can have a have a peek at it as you as you go up. Right, we've all clocked that. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, let me down turn now to uh, Peter Offenshaw to have a, a, a kind of wider view of this interaction between art and science. And I think that you found the perfect quote for us. No, oh, yes, I, I wondered whether you would ask. So I for twenty years I was. Um, trying to introduce medical students to the idea that there's more to medicine than, than, than science. Um, and certainly we would never allow somebody into medical school if we thought that they were just interested in the science. They had to have a lot more than that. And I would often start my tutorials with this quote from Hippocrates. So, life is short and the art long, the occasion fleeting, experience fallacious, and judgment difficult. And I think that's such a wonderful um, expression of the importance of, of art and the, and the depth that you need to go to in medicine. Because you see that medicine is actually a performance. It's, it's, it can be interpreted in that way. Um, when, you, when you take a history from somebody, the act of listening is, I think, um, an act of responding to a person more than just the words that they're saying. It's interpreting their performance to you. Then you're constructing a narrative and constructing that narrative is akin to being an author. And then as you relate that narrative to others, you're telling a history, you're telling a story. It's about the storytelling, which again is performative. It, it's as if you are an actor performing a, a, a seamless um, portrayal of the story that you've that you've gleaned, and I, I think just to illustrate the you know the, the the way that some people think about medicine. When we were first imperialized 25 years ago, we were celebrating our 25th year with Imperial College. I remember the um, the the rector at that time um, explaining that the future of medicine was. Um, was a mechanical one based in the physical sciences and that uh, a computer would extract the history. Um, we would then allow the patient to proceed through a scanner into the hospital and all their inner workings would be revealed. We would then sample their body fluids and these would be subjected to omics. We would then analyze their genetic makeup, compare that with their omic profile and design the perfect drug for them to exit the hospital. And of course, we medics thought that this was a fine idea, but nowhere connected with the reality of medicine as both an art and, and as a science. And we had a conversation, you and I, with Dr. Nibet, mm -hmm. here, um, who's a very distinguished surgeon. And he was saying that some aspects of surgery, the theatrical team uh, behave almost like members of a ballet in that they move from one place to another and there's a there's a certain sort of pattern about uh, their interactions yeah it's wonderful to see roger here tonight um who is absolutely the person who should be sitting here talking about the art of the medicine um but and i think it is so interesting to reflect the way in which um the choreography not only in on operating theater but also in the examination room and, and, in, and also in scientific laboratories, you know, the way in which your movements are choreographed as you go into containment laboratories where you're working with high, high level pathogens. All of this, you know, you could interpret in, in, in the form of dance. So it's clear that you think art and science 
enrich each other. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think at its best, you know, what science can do is to, is to smooth and enable the process by which we, um, we deliver the artistic component of our work. And without the art, it would not be successful. And without, without the art, it would really not be um, in any way um, the same healing process. It would just be mechanical. That's such an interesting perspective. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I want to turn now to uh, Michael Rosen. Uh, Michael, you did a poem for this. So yes. would you like to read us your poem? Yeah. I watch myself from the ceiling of a hospital ward. I'm still inert, tubes running into my arm, into my nose and my throat. I'm being made better. It's night, a nurse takes my blood pressure, then my oxygen saturation. She observes me, reads some figures, lit up on a screen, she writes them down. I'm being made better. Now my place on the ceiling to watch myself is at a rehab hospital. I hold a frame. Three people are there to coach me or catch me. I take a step. It's the first step. I'm being made better. Thank you. So would your picture of health been rather different prior to your COVID experience? Uh, yes, totally, because anybody who goes through uh, something that, that I went through, so I was 40 days in intensive care, um, so I came out of that and I couldn't move and couldn't walk um, at all, and certain things damaged permanently, my eye and my ear, and my toes strangely numb. Um, so as a consequence of that, um, we in the West have this idea that the mind and the body are separate, you medics know that's not true. Um, for example, you're walking around with an image of your body in your head. You know what it feels like to wave your arms in the air. You've got an image of that. Well, if you have something like that, a line, it happens because of an, um, an accident or uh, a stroke, say, then your body image has changed completely. So it's disrupted. You've got the hangover of the old one, but there's this new one that you're coping with. So that's the situation that I found myself in uh, coming out of the coma. There was this other person that I had to get to know. So that's the body in mind. So we, we don't often think of it that way. We, we often think the mind it delivers instructions to the body, you know, some sort of thing. The mind goes, bomb, move your arm. Yes, okay. But in actual fact, the the body is in the mind. Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a concept that we don't think about until something as catastrophic. Yes, and it's because we separate us. things so much in Western culture. I mean, the other way I, I faced it was in the rehab hospital where people are telling me to do things. So they're saying, catch this balloon. And first of all, I couldn't because this eye is wonky, so my parallax is all gone, so I'd missed the balloon. And then she would say, Ashima would say, throw the balloon. And it was too heavy because all my stomach muscles have gone. So I can't lift the balloon. I can't lift my arms. And so that situation in the rehab hospital, um, how can I put it? Um, there's a way in which it didn't matter actually what the, what the, physios and occupational therapists were telling me if I didn't tell myself to do it when they weren't there. So there was a sudden whole thing that I had to do, which was to sort of make myself my teacher. And obviously I'd gone through most of my life not bothering to do that, because you just get up and do it. Or if you do swimming like I used to do, well, you sort of do it in a very mechanical way, you know, do 50 lengths, right, 50 lengths and you do it but now this was a whole different thing because I had to almost every minute of the day be have this teacher person inside me um, obviously Ashma and Emma and these others in, in, the, in St Pancras were giving me these things but it, it, the, the moment it really struck me was when I was sitting in the canteen place and the bloke said I think I'm going to bunk off this afternoon 
And of course, that was just like the school model, where you, when you're at school, you think teachers are teaching it because they get a kick out of it. <laughs> and, <Do> not? <laughs> and the best way to deal with them is to bugger off, is just to say, well, her, I've shown them. Well, her, I'm not going to school today. I'm, I'm, tr I'm bumping off. And this bloke was still in the same mindset. And I was thinking, I wanted to say to him, without being patronised, I wanted to say to him, actually, you're bunking off from yourself, pal, because this is incredibly valuable stuff we're getting in there, and all it's going to do is slow you down. This was a guy who had creeping gangrene up his feet, um, and they were basically trying to sort that out at the same time as teaching him how to walk. And I was thinking, well, you know, grab every minute you can. And that made me think, that's what I've got to do as well. So it was the same thing. So, um, yeah, I think I've said that one. Yes. <laughs> and I wondered actually if we have been made actually more creative in some way by our experience of COVID. There seems to have been a flowering of creativity, of people doing things that perhaps were it was a time afforded by lockdown. Mm. But creativity and doing something beyond your daily mm. chores seems to be very, very important to people. Yes, I, I mean, I think we are all are so desperate to get back to the interactions with each other, the interactions with works of art, going to galleries, you know, doing all those things we used to take for granted. And experiences like Michael's, I think, you know, really make us realize just how important it is to appreciate those everyday things that we took for granted before COVID. And uh, when you look at a programme like Grace and Perry's um, Art Club, that just took off like a rocket during COVID, and people wanted to paint, they wanted to pour out what was in their heads mm. through the medium of art in a way that perhaps perhaps they haven't been enabled to do that before, given permission perhaps even. What do you think, Michael? Well, yeah, I mean, I think for egocentrically, the, the problem for many people when you're ill is finding ways to express it. Mm. So this is looking at it through the telescope slightly differently. Um, and it's quite a challenge. I mean, it's been a challenge various times in my life. So when my son died of meningitis, of uh, meningococcal septicemia, the very first experience I had was that I couldn't write about it. So there was an immediate block on creativity, if you like. I just, just couldn't go there, that it was just too dangerous somehow or other. And what triggered it off was actually reading somebody else's poem. It was Raymond Carver's poem called uh, On Being Locked Out. And it's a wonderful poem. Do read it, folks. Um, it's where he sees, he, he gets locked out of his uh, study and he looks back into his study. Of course, he's not there. And so he contemplates his study without him being there, without saying that it's about death, of course. And I've read this over and over again. Because of the way in which he unfolds words onto the page, that immediately then, almost like that hour, enabled me then to find a voice. And this business of finding a voice to describe illness is a, um, it's very powerful because a lot of people don't or can't. And, you know, I've discovered since writing a book about it that uh, people say, you know, I, I can't find a voice to do it. Thank you for writing it. That, that was similar to me or whatever. I was in intensive care or something like that. <clears throat> How do you do it? And then I describe this process of unfolding, which I describe, but basically it involves you thinking of whatever phrase comes into your head, put it down, but don't try and create uh, if you like, coherent sentences do just the opposite. Try not to be coherent and let it unfold one line after another under each other. So, for example, uh, doctors kept coming up to me when I was uh, came out of the coma and um, saying, you were very poor. <laughs> <laughs> and, they do that. <laughs> and I kept thinking, are they telling me I was a bit ill? Because at that point, I didn't know I'd lost 40 days from my life. I had no idea. I just thought I'd been in and that I'd somehow been moved to another ward. Um, and because obviously of COVID restrictions, there wasn't Emma coming in every day going, you know, this is what happened to you. So I'm sort of, Emma is your wife. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, there's two Emmas. There's Emma the physio and Emma, Emma my wife. Really. 
Just, so, um, just made that clear. <laughs> I'm not married to Pooja. And um, yeah, so uh, I had no idea. So I've just put down very poorly. So I've sort of pulled that out of the atmosphere and then another line under it saying, that's what they keep saying. But you don't have to be grammatical. You can actually use the, the tricks of, you know, beginning of the 20th century writing, Joyce and Wolf, people like that, so that you can actually just express this stuff much more freely. And um, that's how I've been able to do it. Yeah. Peter. That's such a wonderful account you've given. And it made me think of a very personal story, which I might share, which is that when my mother first developed dementia, the first thing that went was her ability to communicate. And I remember sitting with her in the kitchen in Glastonbury and saying to her, I wish I could understand what your advice to me would be. And she looked at me with eyes that showed no recognition and then quietly got up, went upstairs to her bedroom and came down with a packet of poems that she had written, tied in a red ribbon, which she presented to me and then sat down again. And clearly the problem was not that she hadn't understood me, but that she hadn't any way of expressing her thoughts. And I hadn't appreciated how much she was understanding, but unable to communicate. And she was still able to think that she could communicate with me through those poems that she'd never shown anyone before. Mm -hmm. I'm having that experience with a friend of mine who's had sort of a series of mini strokes and he understands what I'm saying, but he can't then speak in reply. So he starts and then he stops. It just sort of runs out, whereas he used to be a very garrulous sort of bloke, but he just then stops. I mean, I haven't seen him the one, sorry, but not close friend. Anyway, so I just had that experience for an hour where he, he it sort of came to an end. It just was, but it was there. Um, I think Kate Garraway is explaining it, was saying it's something similar to Derek Drake, who incidentally was in the next door bed to me in the wicked room. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's take some questions from the audience if anyone has uh, some questions for our uh, panel. A long time. Um, the whole, from start to finish, I guess it was about six months. Okay. How long did it take to do oh, your weekend it and a lot of wine? <laughs> right, <laughs> let's see if we do. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I'm really interested in the communication with patients have around the Perhaps one of the best things is uh, what um, uh, Kate Amuel has done, which is set up the bigger picture. I don't know if you know about this, which is for um, health workers to write poetry themselves. She's produced a book called These Are the Hands, which is named after my poem. And Kate Amuel, uh, coincidentally, um, was the woman who saved my life uh, because Emma was getting, Emma White, not Bougia, uh, was getting <laughs> worried that uh, after 20 days in bed in March that uh, things didn't look too good, or she put it, shadow of death across my face. Um, and um, it was a bit difficult at the time to get, you well, couldn't get tested. And if you rang up the paramedics, they said, breathe down the phone. So I remember going, I said, yeah, that sounds all right. Um, and Emma got worried, so she rang Katie, who lives in the next door street, and she came round with an oximeter and uh, put it on my finger, and it read 58. And um, 
uh, Katie said, is that the pulse? <laughs> and Emma said, no, the pulse is 112. And she said, oh, right, you've got to drive them to the hospital quick. Uh, it's much more panicky than that, you can imagine. Um, but Katie runs this thing called the bigger picture, which offers up a, a, another kind of interaction. So I'm slightly dodging your question by saying that um, it's incredibly important for practitioners to take a 360 degree view of themselves, which will enable them to interact with patients in, in, in humanistic ways. That's how, that's how I think she sees it. I'm putting words in her mouth, but it's also how I, I would see it. So I'm very lucky that in intensive care, the nurses kept a patient diary, what I call a very patient diary. And um, I have these, this is a document. I have 40 entries or so. And it's incredible because the writing is better than mine. It's much better than mine because it's so direct. You know, we had to prone you, which meant that seven of us had to turn you over. I just think you know, that's just beautiful writing. It's just wonderful. There's all sorts of things like that. If people in work describe it, we forget sometimes medicine work, sorry folks, but we do on the outside. We just think it's sort of magic guys with pills and syringes, um, but you're working. And this is like 40 days. It's a book of work from and, these nurses. And of course, the reason why that diary keeping has become so important in intensive care units is because uh, when patients come out of an intensive care unit, they don't have the same recollections of their time inside an intensive care unit as their relatives do. Yeah. So you will say, this happened to me, and the relative will say, no, 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 that never happened, that never happened, this happened. And actually, it's a, it's a record, but without that record, people get often very confused afterwards, and people do far better if they have a diary subsequent to, uh, you know, in their recovery, than if they don't have a diary. Yeah, so that's... there you are, you know, a diary, a, a piece of writing, directly the evidence is extremely strong that it that it helps people recover more effectively and also that the nurses treat instead of you just being um, a bunch of tubes wrapped in skin which is what the human body is right instead of that they do treat you like a human being so i've got a nurse saying for example i could see from the picture at the end of your bed you support arsenal um <laughs> I spoke to you about that, well, but I told you that I supported Derby. You weren't very impressed. <laughs> well, I was in a coma, but anyway, you know. Um, but I mean, the point is, and they were holding my hand. And, and just as an idea of how they saved my life, my blood pressure was acting like a yo-yo, as one of them says. It was diving, and they will shake it every two hours in order to try and bring my blood pressure up. Well, it's easier to do that if you think the person's a human being. And as I say, if they think you're a a bunch of tubes that maybe maybe work for them, maybe not, you know, give it a bit of a shove or something. But uh, but it was traumatic for them at that time. We should say that. I mean, there's nurses who can't go back. I've met nurses who can't go back because of the mortality rate and the pressures they were under at that time. You have to bear in mind the toll this takes on health workers. So 42% of us were dying in that ward. And instead of it being one nurse to one patient, it was one nurse to three, four, sometimes five. It was 11 days and it was uh, 24 patients. In it. So this is March and April, May uh, 2020. So it was a traumatic time. So we, we have to remember the level of trauma on both sides. You know, it's obviously patient trauma, but there's health worker trauma. So our picture of health now is very, very different to what our picture of health was in those dreadful early months of 2020. And actually, it's relied on extraordinary science that we have that complete change in our picture of health. There was an incredible moment that Professor Hugh Montgomery described to me. He said that when the patients first came in with COVID and they were taking blood samples, the blood was sticky, it wouldn't go into the syringe. And they couldn't understand it. And of course, people were also dying just like that. And he said that, I think he said, they rang China. There's an idea of how medicine works. They rang China and said, what's going on? They said, well, the blood is sticky because something's going on with the coagulating system with the body. So instead of, you know, it's obviously blood comes out, it clots, but you don't want it to clot in the system, jams up the tubes. Um, and this was going, COVID was doing this. 
so they were then whacking warfarin and um, the fixaban into them. Uh, but it's just that moment that he's described is just extraordinary, isn't it? Because across the world, the wires are humming with people saying, what's going on? What is this illness? Because we thought it was respiratory and now we find it's vascular. And so there we were, we were guinea pigs, but that was a, an extraordinary moment he described to me. I just think that's, that's amazing. And as it happens, I had clots as well in my brain and my pulmonary artery. So I was lucky to get away with that. Well, we're very, very delighted to have you back well, with us. Well, that wasn't... Uh, the, the, very yeah. delighted to have you back with us. That's, and That was this hospital did that. The hospital and, and hospitals and Emma did that. My wife, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, Emma, the physio, also helped. <laughs> yes. Oh, you bet. <laughs> so uh, all of you have just given us a wonderful, wonderful account of the way that uh, you think about the interaction of art and science and a picture of health. So on behalf of us all, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. You're having a good time. Yeah. It's great, isn't it? It, it, it? You know, you always know when you come to an LMS event that they're going to be brilliant because they're just so different to the kind of any other uh, event that you might go to in science land. It's just wonderful. Right, just hooray for them. Mm. So I'm now going to do a bit more about uh, hooray and huzzah for uh, LMS uh, because we're going to be having a bit of a kite theme here. That's because we want to fly a kite for the LMS in its beautiful uh, new building. And we want to see them soar away to those blue skies because this is a research institute this is primarily concerned <clears throat> with blue sky research. So they don't know what will happen as a result of their research. It's curiosity driven, but what comes out of it in the end just goes through, not just throughout the UK, but throughout the world. And it makes a huge difference. So I, I used to be on the MRC Council. We are extraordinarily proud of the LMS and what it does. So our kind theme is going to continue during our break when you will have the opportunity to not only, well, you won't be able to fly your kite, I'm afraid, but you will have an opportunity to make a kite. And there were, if you feel so inclined, there are kite making materials for you. And you uh, can also have a look, of course, at uh, all the exhibits. For those of you who are watching online through streaming, we are going to be back with you at 8.20, so do pop off and put something, uh, put the kettle on or have a quick glass and we'll be back with you at 8.20. And again, thank you to our panel and we're going to talk about the communication of science uh, through art in our second panel discussion, which will be back here at 8.20. So, are you ready for more? I don't think I heard you. Are you ready for more? Yes. Fantastic. All of you who are now watching at home, there is more and it's going to be fabulous. So we had a bit of a theme with kites. Um, let's just have a little, little interlude of kite for you. When I was a kid, I was interested in kite flying. So I stopped doing it for a long period of time. And during COVID, I decided to make kites again. I've been working for the LMS for nearly 14, getting on to 15 years now. And today we're here to do a kite workshop, making kites with about 10 to 15 students. People know that there's a sort of imperial campus at Hammersmith. But I don't think they necessarily particularly know that much about the LMS. And I think part of that has been because we've been in just sort of a random building. The new building is basically a state-of-the-art facility. It was made purposefully for translational and experimental medicine. I love the big windows and I think it'll be quite a fun space for us to have. And I think this gives us an opportunity to interact more between the labs and at the same time improve the way we socially interact. I think we just reverse engineering the kite. 
Normally, scientists love to have a proper protocol where we follow step by step. I mean, for me, I think it's great to have a balance of both discovery-based research and also how you translate that into impacts later on. I think there's a lot of bridge between art and science. Like, I think scientists need to be a little bit artistic in order to uh, survive in this environment because we need to have new ideas, we need to create new experiments. And for me, it's kind of like an art. I think it's great that we can combine both of them. The more we try to help each other, the more we socialize uh, among each other. This creates kind of a family that allows us not only to feel this like this is our home, but also improve our science. And I think we've done a pretty good job in that regard. I would like to encourage everyone to come and fly a kite for the LMS. Many thanks. Now come go fly a kite. <laughs> Lovely. How nice is that? Although you want to be slightly careful here flying a kite very close to Wormwood Scrubs. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're talking in this second session that we have now about communicating science. And I wanted to start off here with, uh, before we introduce our panel to you, um, with somebody communicating science through poetry. Now, Heidi Williamson is a very uh, distinguished uh, poet, a reader in poetry, and she's produced many works. And for this particular event, she's come up with a poem on the microbiome. Now, some of you will know what that is, but I hope by the end of Heidi Williamson's poem, you know a little more about it. Let's see her. So my microbiome guzzle has a quote at the beginning of it from the renowned immunologist and poet Miroslav Holub, who was one of the first poets I really admired. It's from his poem, In the Microscope, and the quote goes, Here too are dreaming landscapes. Here too are the masses, tillers of the soil. Microbiome Guzzle. How little the average us knows about what goes on inside our own bodies. We deny the existence of trillions of lives there inside. How rarely we think of their minuscule schemes. We seldom discuss them. Meanwhile, second by second, whole habitat of unseen species glare inside our guts, eyebrows, skin, our own intimate bacteria, protozoa, fungi, viruses passed on to us like genes. If we could open up and stare inside, we might see the chemical communities, currents and settings that shape us. If we witness what our friends, partners, enemies where inside. We might see ensembles we have in common. A skin that attaches only to itself is miserly. I imagine it peaceful, but perhaps it's warfare inside. Each strand bound by loyalty 
to its own kin, whatever that is. This messy vision of shapes, this clutter of colours and actions, like some vast fairground inside, makes my head spin. They could be our primal guides, if only we knew how to listen. They go about their business, but I hear language is rare inside. They're more copious than ourselves, so who possesses whom is a delicate question. I suspect we're not gracious hosts, but I wonder if they care. Inside, they protect themselves and us. Without us, they're orphans or worse. Without them, we can't mind our own body or care for its welfare inside. This conglomerate called Heidi, what is it really? I'm not even CEO. Still, my microbiome, this unsung company, it sustains me knowing they're inside. Lovely, thank you. And let's welcome our next panel. So could I bring our panel please up to the So I'm very pleased to introduce you, first of all, to a man who needs no introduction to any of you, uh, Palav Gosh, science correspondent for BBC News, also president of uh, the ASBW, so a very, very important <laughs> group of science writers who often gather together for a glass or three <laughs> uh, to talk about uh, the, the kind of how they get uh, science out uh, to the public. Um, then we have Declan O'Regan, who leads the Computational Cardiac Imaging Group. Um, computational Cardiac Imaging, just tell us what that is. Uh, well, so I'm a radiologist, and basically, you know, I've made a kind of living out of images, um, and basically, essentially, starting from the inside of patients and working outwards. So what in our group we do is we turn those images into computational models of the heart. So like 3D images of the heart, so we can then understand genetics and environment and its effects on the heart. So like an artist uses images um, every day. And uh, finally, we have uh, Sean Hardy, Emeritus Professor of Cardiac Pharmacology. And I want to start with you, um, Sean, because you have an image in this exhibition. Yeah. And we'll just, I hope we're going to see it. But just... Talk us, here it is. Yes. Tell us what we're looking at. So this is my favourite cell. This is a cardiomyocyte. And so this is an individual heart muscle cell. So what, I, I work different way from Dick. I, I take all the heart apart and, and, and get this individual cardiomyocyte. And, and, and we can stain it, if you see, with it. this is quite a sort of ordinary thing to do, to stain the muscle fibres. You can see how beautifully organised that is. Now, generally speaking, it's, it's in a syncytium. It's... Um, uh, it's attached with the other, the other three to five million cells in your heart. And they're attached all over. And it, the heart acts in a bit like a, one giant cell because they're so well attached. But we can't image it well because uh, it's so dense. And so taking it apart like this allows us to study the cells. They, they still beat. I mean, one of, one of the uh, sad things about these images is that they're static, and, um, but they beat beautifully, and contract and relax. And, so a bit um, like a kind of Roman gallery, uh, you know, one of those warships. Exactly. You look down the, the microscope and they're all beating together like that. You know, so the beautifully. So like the that. drum master goes exactly. like that and exactly. they all row at the same I turn the frequency up or, or whatever, yeah. And um, because of this, first, you, this is a healthy cell. It's healthy in the sense that it hasn't been damaged at all, but also from a healthy heart. And so I've taken these cells from the failing human hearts. And so we've been able to see that some of the cells, uh, how, how they change in their form in the failing heart. And we've been able to, to dig right down even to sublight levels 
by doing a scanning ion conductance microscopy where you scan the cell. And you get a kind of contour map by running an electrode just a little way away from the surface, and it just keeps at the same distance. It drives a whole contour map of the cell. And so you can see the indentations, and you can see how that changes in heart failure, and that's, that change in form is part of the disease. And we've also got some images from Frank Close, of course, one of our most distinguished, uh, well, one of our most distinguished theoretical physicists, one of the world's most distinguished theoretical physicists. Uh, Declan, I'm going to look at you because uh, to explain what we're seeing here, because uh, you and Frank Close have something in common here. Which very, is, very slightly. I wouldn't very say I'm a particle physicist, but um, we do do PET imaging. So PET imaging is positron emission, emission tomography. tomography. Yeah. So although you wouldn't say this to the patient, you inject the patient with antimatter, basically. And so the positrons and the electrons annihilate and they produce uh, a gamma ray, which can be picked up by a camera. So that's sort of uh, the sort of inverse of what we have here in some ways. Um, but it's a fantastic technique because really it's a kind of embodiment of Einstein's equation of equating energy and mass. And when you have matter and antimatter, that is converting into pure energy. And we can use that by binding it to glucose, and glucose is taken up by cancer. And so we can see those light up on the scan to see whether hidden areas of cancer in the body. And we've got one further image to show, which comes from a Steve Gershmeissner. Uh, Steve's with us. Where's Steve? Oh, he's there. So let's. So what are these, Steve? Uh, they're mesenchymal stem cells. Mesenchymal. Now, is it right that you cover these according, because of course you don't know what colour they are, you're, you're adding colour. Is there an art in producing these images? The electron microscope uses electrons to form an image. Colour comes from light, so you get black and white images. So they're post-coloured just to make them, well, everyone wants to come here with me. <laughs> so they're, they're false colored essentially and the way you cover them they could have been equally orange they could have been, <laughs> I mean, in, in reality they, they, they have no color to the naked eye is it i mean space images we're, we're thinking in much the much the same so radiology images they're always in black and white but in the media they're always in lurid colors as well so this is one small bug bears that MRI scans or chest X-rays always get colorized into these rather glorious images in the media. But the color is great, you know, and it makes it more accessible. And actually, the power of image is extraordinary in terms of communication because of, we'll think about the public in a moment, but actually for public scientists, an image can be the start of a new discovery. What comes to you, do you think? Uh, Sean, your image that tells you more about the function. So um, the the uh, the as I was describing the contour map. Once you've lost that uh, hill and valley uh, and sort of the, there are indentations that go into the cell, the tissue of you. Once you've lost that, you know that you've lost the connections between the action potential coming along and the calcium being uh, sort of, uh, released in, for the contraction. So you can understand that. In there. So what about the images that you show to, I could call them lesser mortals, but you'll know what, but people who are not as accomplished as you are in the art of the computational diagnostic imaging. So, I mean, I think obviously it's great to show patients their images. And I think that's a fantastic experience for them sometimes to be able to see their own healthy body, but also to be able to understand how disease has affected their own body. I think that can be quite a powerful part of understanding your own disease and the tests and investigations you have is to actually being able to see the insides, be able to see the effects that a disease is, is having. We had Michael talk about the effect of COVID on the lungs, for instance. And of course, during the pandemic, that's all that we were seeing in radiology was one terrible chest x-ray after another, one awful scan after the other, affecting the lungs and causing clots and so on. So I think it's very powerful 
tool for communicating to patients and the public, but also, again, to the rest of the scientific community. Our work in imaging is, is inherently very, very visual, uh, and it's also moving. The heart is a moving organ, uh, and so all of the work that we do captures the motion of the heart. So actually, it's something, it's the only real part of radiology and imaging that's constantly moving, and the thing that's interesting and important and has value is understanding the motion of the heart. When we try and get stories away in the media, unless we have a good picture, often we can't get the story into the media in a way that we want. Well, it's absolutely essential, particularly for TV, but also for the website. I think that uh, these images are terribly important because, you know, it's hard to keep lots of numbers in one's head uh, to try and get a proper perspective and understanding of what's going on to have a picture of the COVID virus, for example, that kind of brought a familiarity and a focus for all the, uh, you know, sometimes quite complex information that people were given. Is there a time, I mean, I'm surprised by about this particularly, but somehow, if you show pictures with dumbing down, and dumbing down is a terrible kind of accusation that's thrown at scientists that when they you know, go on that appear in media very frequently. Is that fair? I don't know whether scientists do feel that. I mean, you, you, you deal with them as much, as much as I do. And I just wonder if attitudes have changed. Um, you know, the, the, when I first started, speaking to a journalist was seen as a pretty shameful thing to do. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but now, you know, it's it's... I think you've got a new generation of scientists that do want to talk about what they're doing. Um, and, and it's almost a valuable part of their career, rather than as something to be kind of tolerated or, oh, they do that. Well, exactly. And, and the th I don't know why it is that perhaps you've had a generation of scientists that have grown up with science being on the television and on the radio, that it seems like a natural thing to do. And the value of... Um, science communication is, is not just to justify, you know, the, how your money is being spent so you can get another grant in three years' time, but the public service of actually empowering people, that they have the information they need to make some really important decisions in their life. And it's never more the case than in healthcare. So when, you know, a loved one or yourself has to undergo an operation and so forth, you hoover in scientific information. And of course, during COVID, when, you know, to start with, all of us, including the scientific community, were in the dark about what was really going on. I mean, as a journalist, that was kind of uh, such a thrilling time. Obviously a terrible time, but a thrilling time in terms of scientific developments weren't happening daily, but several times a day. Uh, and just to be able to kind of assimilate that process that and give them to a public that was so hungry for scientific information. And so going back to your original question, I, I, I think that you know, it's not seen as a shameful thing to do to kind of show pictures or diagrams or whatever, because I think we've got a scientific community that knows that you know, there's a hunger and real appetite for serious scientific information. And so you know, it's not a thing anymore. It's just a kind of, it's as natural as breathing, as far as I'm concerned. It's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, people can say to me that, um, it's about genomics, but it's my particular area, that, oh, it's very difficult, and people need it explained. Um, and I think that you've got to be really very technical information at the moment that they need to absorb it. And so it's about a moment in time that you need to pick the moment when people want the information. I mean, we don't know how our tummies can do that and how all this works, but do we care about it or look at how they work until they go wrong? But when they do go wrong and you need to do it, we can move. So it's very almost retention. I mean, that's a. <laughs> Well, 
well, dare I say, I'd suggest that science is more interesting than pensioning. <laughs> in, in the, in the, sorry, just to finish the point off, in that obviously with things like COVID and your operation and things like that, you will, you know, look at those articles. But, you know, my experience on the BBC News website, where we gather lots of data, uh, you know, not, not just in terms of the audience, you know, the numbers, but how far they've read, how long they've read, you know, everyone does it. And so the stories that do well aren't necessarily the kind of the need to know science, but, you know, the, the slightly difficult science, genomics does really well. Um, I mean, the things that I'm particularly interested in is, the, you know, the things that are happening in subatomic physics. We're on the, the verge of a kind of complete transition to a big new theories, you know, the same thing that happened 100 years ago with Einstein. And the general public love it. You know, when there's a story about a problem with the standard model, you know, you think, you know, at first sight, you think, oh, what is that? But it is the number one story on the BBC News website. You know, even when Boris Johnson is doing something he shouldn't or whatever, science does what you do, you know, particularly here where you're doing some kind of quite detailed stuff, there's a hunger for that as well as finding out whether you know, we should have a vaccination or not. Yeah, and, and, and actually the things that are really expensive that get you this huge round of love for, you know, the kind of stuff that Brian Cox makes up about. The, the astrophysics, I mean, you know, just tell you the name of two hundred dinosaurs. It, it's important, have a chance. Um, yes, uh, I, I was just going to say uh, the, the, the power of the image, though, um, to, to, to justify things. I'm, one of the things that we've done is make some cardiac tissue out of stem cells. And so that's uh, cells that you can make skin cells and turn back into stem cells, so they match to the person. And we can differentiate them to cardiac myocytes, and they beat away. We can make like quite large pieces of tissue from them. And so when you say to you explain that to a person, okay, that's great. You and then you say, look at this, and this is a piece of tissue beating away, you know, on your in your hand. That's very powerful. That's a really powerful image that they will believe you because of that. The question here. But isn't it the big thing <laughs> so if you didn't get that on the screen, this is a very good comment about caring for tens of millions of scientists who's a sort of an um, organization, self-organization, as one would call it. And one of the marvelous things that Aaron Tree did is Aaron Tree worked with a uh, textile vendor who won the of the uh, Nobel Textiles. And so he worked with self-replication. Am I getting this right, somebody? Help me with the slide. So, <laughs> self-replication and he worked with somebody who worked with textiles and they worked together and she produced a textile which as it came off the loom organized itself into shape because of the way that it was woven. And Aaron Tree, when he did his whole diagram, he had an actual textbook that showed how self-organization of materials could work. So they were the power of the elements in showing Nobel scientists how what they are working on actually can be visioned. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, Carol, but, uh, come back to uh, communication. We we've seen a lot of disinformation. I mean, COVID has just just kind of put it on supercharged. Uh, 
you see all sorts of things that that make it very difficult to get at uh, science. How are we, are we going to navigate those waters in the future? Well, I think COVID, uh, in some ways, was a, a a kind of real test of how far, or a real validation of how far we've come with um, science communication. You know, one of the I mean, clearly the priority once the pandemic broke was to devote resources to medical care and scientific research. But a huge amount of effort was put into explaining it. You know, every day, Chris Whitty and Patrick Vallance and people from SAGE were on stage talking to the public. And when they weren't on stage, you know, they were talking to journalists like us so that we could explain it to the public. And as a result, we've got one of the highest uptakes of vaccination in the entire world. You know, people did understand, and when there were these complications with the um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, that was quite a complicated story, and a complicated story to explain. But I think people got the fact that they they're better off getting vaccinated against you know a certain severe illness against this kind of tiny risk of blood clots. So I I do think that um, you know the, the the fact so, you know, science communication was up there among, you know, creating new drugs, you know, uh, it, it is a real testament to how now everyone gets it and the community. You know, when I, I, I'm so grateful whenever I made a call to a scientist. I mean, they had work to do to try and save lives, but they found time to speak to me so that I could explain it to the general public. I've seen a great way but that's misinformation i guess that we need to counter but there's also on the other side two ways of science fiction and film i mean science fiction has always been fascinating so an art form that people will sometimes say predicts science although actually if you look a bit closer to it it really doesn't but how far do you think science fiction is affecting our view of science and is that a, an issue you think it's um, well, you know, I don't know. I think I think a lot of the discussion, I'm not sure about science fiction exactly, but a lot of the discussion in social media can become very partisan. And I think people have very kind of rigid views. You almost think that on Twitter, gathering lots of different diverse views would kind of equalize people's opinions a little bit. But I think it kind of does the opposite and makes them become more polarized in many ways. And I guess maybe one of those reasons is that it's not very egalitarian, is that it's quite centric on one or two for a small number of people who are very, very influential influences. And a small shift in a partisan view can cause a big shift in opinion in people who kind of follow them. So I think whether it's from science fiction or whether people have, you know, very fixed ideas about the world that are, you know, resistant to being changed by evidence, I think sometimes, you know, a nidus some of very influential people can have a very disproportionate effect on people's general opinion. But should scientists become Is that an interesting thing that they should consider doing? I mean, we've talked about science, scientists becoming better communicators, and we've seen a lot of that in COVID, but are, is the next stage getting them to be influencers? I suppose they're never going to be quite as sexy, somehow, maybe. <laughs> Not quite. So, but, <laughs> but, you know, you have people like Brian Cox, you know, have enormous numbers of followers, and he weighs in... He wades into all sorts of things outside his areas of science, right? And, you know, he'll discuss political things and he'll discuss social things. And I think that's great. But he's bringing a scientific mind to bear on a social problem or what he sees as being, you know, some illogical or non-evidence-based thing, which is often around Brexit, for instance. Um, so, you know, I think those kind of influences can be really important. Um, and also, maybe just to touch on, you know, Palad was talking about kind of uh, Chris Whitty's data and so on. People like John uh, Byrne Murdoch in the FT, who produced these beautiful graphs and plots and diagrams throughout the pandemic, showing how the uh, the pandemic was progressing and the effect of vaccines and the pressure on the NHS. You know, in many ways, these were actually really impressive visual artworks because they conveyed something complicated in a very immediate, understandable way. But he also made the effort to talk people through them and point out the gotchas and the things that could easily be misinterpreted or latched on by people with only a superficial knowledge. So I think people like that, the kind of data science, data scientists, can be really influential. 
and I think they have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of traction on social media. Michael, you're a parent. You've got some things. Of course you can. Uh, I think the unfortunate moment, March the 13th, 2020, three government scientists came into the media and talked about herd immunity. <laughs> and they didn't explain what they meant by it. And there are many interpretations of what it is. Some people talk about horizontal herd immunity, some people talk about vertical herd immunity, and um, it doesn't matter or both. And um, at least one of them is withdrawn from the position. Uh, I myself feel it's an incredibly dangerous moment. This scientific idea that is being interpreted, that is being taken rather, you know, just as a snapshot, a scientific idea that has such a consequence, I believe, in how governments are behaving in the weeks I was talking about that. I don't understand any of it. I would be thinking, Rob, 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 I'm not on the, uh, again about this comment on the on the individuals, but how did that play out? Do you think that the idea of um, it's quite What I'd say as someone who was covering that and that particular story, I mean, my jaw dropped when I shall name the Sir Patrick Ballads of all people use the word herd immunity. Um, I don't know why he said it, but the Department of Health uh, came down on him like a ton of bricks, quite rightly. Um, what I'd say is that you've got to go back to those early days where I mean, I'm just a journalist. You know, Peter and I, Peter should uh, talk about it. But they, there was no vaccine. I think you've got to remember that. So it was hard to see a way out. And the plan, the phrase was to move the curve so that, you know, the priority was to make sure the health service didn't get overwhelmed so that, you know, seriously ill people would come in in dribs and drabs. Um, also, they were delayed into lockdown because the reasoning was that um, uh, people wouldn't stay indoors for more than six weeks. Of course, you know, they were completely wrong about that. Um, and, and so the, the, it, now that we've got all the information we have, it seems like a completely ridiculous thing to have said. But at the time, you know, 
where, when the talk was about moving the curb and washing your hands, that's all, that's all they had. That's all they had. And so it was a different context here. It's one of the things that you have to remember in science communication that scientists are as, as able as anyone else to misstep. But when you misstep in science, you have to immediately be honest and say, well, not particularly just about the, the COVID situation, but we got it wrong, or this was difficult, and actually we didn't get it right in the grid. To be fair, that's exactly yeah. what did happen. And you know, the, so you're absolutely right to point that out as an example. It's a shocking thing to have said. But you had a system that did correct itself. Uh, and they got far more right than wrong. And we're all here now, today, thanks to the heroism of the scientists and the system and the science communication system. So, uh, you know, as journalists, we should look at when things go wrong, but also put it in the context of things largely going right, because the system, in my view, largely got it right. Any thoughts on you? Told about the power of the image as a communication system, that is the side of the point, which is because the image is so powerful, has the ability to act in detrimental in the same way that political cartoons can be very satirical in image. Again, the research I do involves how to translate images in your brain with long black duration. And there's been research showing that you show that image with what's on the yeah, people will believe that result much more because they're going to use it as well. So there is a responsibility as well to use it in the appropriate way. How do we avoid and it depends on the integrity and the and value of the person who used it? But there is a risk of using it in terms of bad values so as to destroy the image of the bust in the image of the person. But I just want to say, actually, Giles may remember the image of the two fat mugs in the court of old mugs from a, and that was, and, and there was an extraordinary story that developed of um, Jeffrey Friedman was the discoverer of the uh, of of fat, and had this, they were lacking in lectin, and he managed to sell these discoveries to Amgen for. $300 million, I mean, just trillions and trillions and trillions. And, and they had all been utterly seduced by that image of those very fat mugs who were then given this hormone leptin, which made them super slim mice. And it turns out that only a handful of people globally have that similar genetic benefit. But it did open up a whole new set of biologies that was not the panacea for research that everyone thought it was going to be, including uh, myself and some people who thought it was going to be the panacea, wasn't a presumptive power. And with a powerful image that this led for, for a couple of years. Now. So powerful images in science can put you on your own path as well as uh, communicate uh, very We are, I guess, as far as you and I are always um, being told that we need powerful images or else our work will not appear. Well, you've got to play the game. I mean, you know, powerful images, the mouse with the ear on their back. That's my film, yeah. Um, but it's about coming up with the beautiful images that you guys come up with. Um, and so, you know, you can bemoan the power of images. They are just powerful. You've just got to make sure that you use them. And, and as I as I say, my experience is, you know, when there are stories um, on the BBC News website about kind of um, real science, complicated science, they do really rather well. You know, uh, it's not just the sensationalist stuff. That, uh, as a journalist, I'm not after the sensational. I am after hits. But uh, I get those hits by doing good science stories. But I just want to come to, because we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately. 
I was just wondering about our audience here and what they have felt on seeing some of these images, these pictures of health that they've seen repeated. And is there any particular image that has really delighted and turned most of them? That anybody would want to just be prepared to talk about what they've seen repeated or they particularly enjoyed? Can I not shout? Is that better? You need a microphone. For about 30 years, I've worked with Steve Geschmeissner's pictures, and I run a company called Science Photo Library. And we specialize in scientific imagery, of which medical imagery is the best the desired and the best selling. So we cover everything, MRIs, CT scans, endoscopes, all of the different kinds of electron microscope images. And so I obviously am very biased in favor of Steve's kind of images. But my concern is that in all of these years, I've been trying to get the scientific community to give us the imagery to sell, and they won't. It's all locked away, and they will not, they're, they're organized in such a way that they can't allow, I think it is that they can't allow someone outside of the community to be selling their images. But the thing is that the public, as you just all said, desperately likes them. I mean, you, you have no idea. We sell them mainly to publishers. We also sell them magazines, websites, <clears throat> advertising, commercial, all sorts of commercial images. They are really loved, but we cannot get enough of it. And, and I see it online all over the place and such beautiful material and so educational. And yet we're, we're strapped. So my my so real they, wish that's a fantastic, fantastic plea to end our event with. <laughs> it's Science a deep plea, I must admit, and I've had it for years. You do not force them scientists. Absolutely. They will bring joy. Just like just like your journalist there has said, the, the, the pop the populate the people want them. They want to see them, they want to understand. The people want your images. <laughs> So please, I'll give you my address. <laughs> Listen, we've had a great, great uh, evening. I want to thank all our panelists. Uh, I want to thank particularly again the magnificent, uh, the wonderful Professor Jane Landon Fisher. I also want to uh, thank my co-conspirators, Kiki von Glauber and uh, Andre Molyneux, because I Those who are watching on our streaming service, it's been such a pleasure having you here. I hope you've really enjoyed yourselves. And I hope that you will look at the LMS website because you will see uh, all the images that we've been talking about, all the pictures of health on their website, and very wonderful they are too. And to all of those who are here, our book is yours. You are allowed <laughs> to take a picture of health. And I hope that you'll treasure it because it really is the most fantastic piece of work. And there's more wisdom and joy and pleasure in these pages than you'll find in many of them. So, I want my copy by the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's fun to enjoy it. And thank you so much for being with us tonight.